Well, I just sort of threw something together this afternoon and people may not have got it. It's just basically give us a order to talk about things. I didn't get it. Oh, you didn't get it? Yeah. For some reason, it didn't come. Yeah. Well, the first email said it. Um, first email, I forgot to do the attachment. Then I thought I'd send a second one, but. I, I got it. But, yeah. So basically, I've got five things here introduction, review of present ordinance, provisions, concerns, everyone can express, work plan, and then it's just adjournment. I mean, this is sort of our first. First meeting. So, um, everyone know everyone at this point? Have you met Ray before? Yes. No. Okay. So, um, do we talk about the present ordinance or? Sure. I guess one, just one question I have from the get go is just how does this? How does this group work then? Are we coming to consensus on, on a set of proposed revisions? Are we a simple majority? Are we going back to the planning board and the conservation commission? And then like how- No, I think this committee, committee would come to its conclusion and bring them to the select board. Yep. And if the select board felt it should go to the town, yeah, you know, uh, amended ordinance which has to be approved by a majority right. of the voters. That, you know, um, and I thought the, the, the conservation commission already had a list of like six items or so. Yeah, well, we sent them a letter of concerns. I was just trying to like understand how the group would work in coming to our proposal for the select board. Do we all have to be in a hundred percent agreement on the list of proposed items, or I don't think just, you'll ever get. Um, well, yeah. you might get, but I think some it, groups operate by consent. Yeah, and I've been part of those groups, so yeah. I'm just you yeah. Know, I, where I we're think at. it's 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 yeah. a consensus. I mean, you could have a majority report and a minority report. You know, to the the select board. Yeah. Um, but it's it's basically. I mean, in the past. In the past, most of the ordinances revisions had gone through the planning board. You know, I mean, that was just a procedure that the planning board would review a particular ordinance or draft a particular ordinance and go to the select board. I think in this case, it's a little different that we have this kind of select committee, so to speak. Steve, I still feel that it should come to the planning board before it goes to the select board. Uh, it, as a tweak, you know, might we might the planning board might see some issues there that we've overlooked. Mm -hmm. Can can I ask? Um, Considering we have one array and there's a proposal for another, can I ask Andy, because I don't have present ordinance in front of me, can I ask someone who's very familiar with it, which I'm assuming is Andy, to review what issues are being, are appearing as a result of now having the arrays and seeing where the ordinance perhaps doesn't give the town guidance when making a decision? I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily expert on that in the room, but I also guess I say, are we jumping into then item number one for moving? Okay, yeah. So should yeah. we review the present order? Do you have yes. a digital that we can send it to Bonnie so that she can? Well, it's in your booklet. Did you get a did you get a copy of the comprehensive um, ordinance for site yeah, review that. and subdivision and it's the provisions for the solar 
start on page 63. It's 6.89, section 6.89, the following. Um, is that on the town website? Too? It is. Yeah. Yeah. All the ordinance. Yeah. It's on the town ordinance. And the, and the solar is just one of the. It, it falls under site review. And so there are sections that talk about special <laughs> stages. Um, I don't think I have it at hand. Okay. And it is on the website. If you go to okay. code enforcement officer and click on that, then it lists all the ordinances. Okay. Um, I mean, I can recap just a little bit. I mean, basically the ordinance tried to delineate different types of projects what type of review process for each specific type. So you have things like projects that really are for a resident. And those would have the least amount. Well, that those would not go through the planning board. That would just be a matter that the code enforcement officer would review it. It should be a simple review, and I think there may be maybe a sign off from the fire chief just to make sure things are, you know, wired correctly, or you know, there's not creating some kind of hazard. And then, then there are um, medium solar, and the physical size. Is equal to or greater than 1,500 square feet, but less than 16,999 square feet. And then we have the large solar energy project that would include the one up on the Ridge Road and the one that's now before the planning board on South Monmouth and Fish Hatchery Road. And so those have planning board review and more kind of stringent requirements. So the, the goal was that if someone wanted to put panels on their house, garage, or just round mounted ones that aren't large, that those could just be a permit process through the code enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's any controversy about delineating those projects, and maybe there will be. We can we can talk about that. And um, I know some of us, you know, as you go through, I mean, what always happens, I think, is when you have a project. You then have the benefit of seeing how the ordinance worked and whether anything was missed or, you know, language could be made clearer or change, you know, whatever. Um, and I know one of the things for me, generally, I mean, since Mama doesn't have zoning, the purpose of the site review was in part to try to make commercial projects fit in as much as possible with the residential um, residences around them. And, and so there are, you know, standards about light, noise, and buffering. And the, the provisions in the site review ordinance talk about buffering only for, from residential properties. And so I think that raises a potential problem that that potentially maybe would mean that if it were just agricultural land next door on one border or whatever, they wouldn't have to screen 
or they might not have to screen along a roadway. And we tried to, you know, in talking with these projects that come in, so far we've been somewhat lucky that they haven't balked at our request that buffering be more extensive. And give you an idea, the, the present project that's under review, um, we sort of raised that issue and they've sent up now an amended plan that has buffering on all, on all sides of the project except on Fish Hatchery Road. And in part, that's because it's really their own land that's there. Uh, they may be just a small jog near the South Monmouth Road, but uh, that was one of the concerns that I had is that maybe we need to have better language in this ordinance, for instance, on, on buffer. Yep. Uh, can I ask? Or, what is the definition of an abutter? Well, the, the technical legal definition is someone who borders the property. However, we expand that in terms of notice requirements. And I think the ordinance says that anyone within 500 feet of the project has to receive some type of written notice. Um, um, I asked because in that site review, part of the discussion was, and this led to, and they, they were amenable, but I think it should be put into the ordinance that buffering be put on all sides. And that again, there's a house, a, a new house, relatively new, across South Monmouth Road that will look directly at that array. And so my question is, did that house, because it's across the road, does that homeowner count as an abutter? And the people across the road um, on fish hatchery, do they count as abutters? And yet they certainly are affected, at least visually, um, a by an array being put up. And so I wonder if, if it's possible to adjust that definition so that even though you don't technically fall into the category of a butter, that because of the way our roads are and, and that, that people be included even though they're technically not defined as the butters. Well, they would get a notice. They would get a notice because they're across the street from the project. But, but that's, I'm, it's more than 500 feet. Well, their land might, might, might be, I mean, if they're on the other side, if their land is on the other side of the South Monmouth Road, closest to the project, they would be in a butter. They get noticed, but I mean, the there's sort of two issues. One is notice and one is, you know, what do you do to fit into the natural environment as much as possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never going to be able to screen that project fully. Of course, the other issue which there's no language around, and I don't know if there should be, but is of what vegetation is actually appropriate for screening. I know yeah. in the initial proposal that the latest developer put forward, they just want to put uh, a particular cultivar of arborvitae around the entire thing. Um, you know, is that appropriate? Is that sufficient as a buffer? I mean, arborvitae is a very slow growing evergreen and, and putting a single cultivar leaves it very susceptible to, mm -hmm. to, to loss. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm so, sure there yeah. are opinions, all sorts of opinions about that in, yeah. in the room. Well, the but issue I mean, of a butters and screening yeah. so that you mitigate 
um, the effect on the surrounding area. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, can we include as we, if we were going to revise the ordinance uh, to include specific language having to do with both the butters and the screening. And I agree with, with Andy um, and Ridge is a perfect example. Yeah, they did planting, they died and they did no evergreens at all. So <laughs> their little shrubs, again, half of them are dead and there are no evergreens, which means that those that survive leaf out, but they might not leaf out until the end of May and they're done by September. That's it, that's your screen. And that's not, I don't think that's appropriate. Okay, Bonnie. Yep. What I'll we may going. need is language in the ordinance that the screening will be maintained, properly maintained over the span of the project. Okay, <clears throat> Ma maintenance is one thing, Ray, but if you're gonna put small shrubs that are only in leaf for four months, then you're not providing a screen. Well, maybe right. there should be language that's, you know, minimum of a certain amount of evergreen components. I mean, you know, it's right. never going to be exact, but I mean, that doesn't seem too onerous. You're going right. to say it has to be at least 50% conifers or, or evergreens. Or something. Yeah. Well, the Ridge Road project, they went to Maine Audubon and they made the recommendations, I think, on the buffer. Right. And it was primarily evergreen recollection because it makes no sense to use deciduous for screening. Yeah. Um, the, the thing you run into, of course, is I don't know if any of you run in ride into Gardner on High Street. Uh, I was gonna yes. raise that. That play tonight. Uh, you want to talk about yeah. property values and everything else? That thing is, oh my God. The, uh, you know, and it takes time for those shrubs to grow. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see the benefit of some of those for four or five or more years, probably. That development, though, has to have been one in this closest to us that I just I feel terrible for the abutters. Yeah. I mean, there's an example of. And yes, they didn't own the land and it was private property, but you know, I mean, that had a, that has to have a huge impact on the property values. I mean, that went from being a field cow pasture to panels right up to everyone. Yeah. I noticed that one home right on the road is now for sale. You know, it's just, which I've heard the same thing from the butters of this new potential project on the South Holmes Road that they are going to move, you know, if it goes in. You know, I could just be people blowing up speed. Yeah. But, and on the total screening of the project, what if the backside of that project butts up against a wooded area? I mean, you know, a, a, a serious forested area. You're going to require them to do buffering planning on the long edge of the woods. You got to have some flexibility, right? Yeah, got to have some flexibility. But at the same time, if you look at the current project on the South Monmouth Road, that company currently is proposing that they're going to come in and cut down half of the buffer strip between mm -hmm. our property and their property. So that, you got to deal with it. That also doesn't make sense. Right. You already have existing mature buffer there. Well, and so there needs to be some language saying you can't do that either, which gets back to the other work, gets to one of the, our other concerns that we raised in our letter was just setbacks what are appropriate setbacks you know is the standard 10 foot my understanding is the standard is that appropriate you know for something that is an industrial development as opposed to a right. normal or what we're all used to commercial or residential development we have 50 foot on the roads um at least that's a setback for Structures, it probably fits the definition of a structure. Yeah, but the sidelines are much, much different. And so, yeah, that's a, a legitimate, it's a legitimate issue for any. I mean, one of the concerns I had was when you set standards sometimes, can you really 
I mean, some are going to have more of a visual impact. Some are going to just have noise impact, a traffic impact. But how differently do you treat solar than any other commercial development? So do we, it may raise the, the question of all the all the type of buffer or all the type of standards we have, whether they need to be kind of adjusted. That we're not just focusing on on solar, like we had for the we had for the wind lines that they had to be kind of a fall zone. Worst case scenario, if something fell down, yeah. that it's going to fall down on the uh, right. developer's property. Yeah not on the, the neighbor, but. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I see solar, uh, the visual impact of solar is almost more reminiscent of a parking lot or something of that sort than just a traditional house, you know, when you look the impact on the abutters. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe it's, yeah, right. Um, so setbacks were another thing that we were another issue that we raised was well we talked about this before the meeting began but just agricultural soils you know what if a project is sited on agricultural soil so the requirements uh, stating that they have to have some sort of agriculture continue on that site um, or at bare minimum being some sort of solar grazing are there going to be standards uh, one of the members of the conservation mission raised the issue of you know should there be standards around um, in other towns, right over in Wales, there's a company that went and clear cut a 20 or 30 acre lot that they're going to put solar on on the Leeds Junction Road. You know, is that, should we have standards around that? I mean, is that acceptable? Um, well, is, is there any language that discusses the idea of dual use, which in this case, um, could be again agricultural grazing, um, and I, I I don't want to disparage one of the company's representatives, but he repeated the myth that goats will eat anything. Well, they won't, and you can easily. I happen to know a goat farmer who became quite incensed, actually that goats were being disparaged. Um, there are one or two types of goats that can jump, um, but goats do not eat metal. And there's no reason why goats could not, in fact, graze on that land, which brings up another question about whether or not the land uh, has been tested for PFAS. Do we know that? And should that be included? Again, that's another, and I don't think even, I don't that's know. That's a that, wider question. I mean, that doesn't, not just solar. No, that's. You know, there was some, I think Carol Skindle mm -hmm. had some, you know, because we passed an ordinance in Monmouth on, um, sludge, spreading. sludge spreading, kind of in response to what? that, but we, you know, we early on, right. but we really before the, the PFAS issue kind of became as you know front and center as it becomes. But I don't think you just make that a standard for solar. But again, I mean, again, that's a bigger question. I think beyond the, the scope of the solar. Provision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think back to your, I don't think we need to get in species specific sort of recommendations or requirements here, but just having, so our current ordinance has the recommendation that there be a dual use projects when on agricultural soils. I think the question is more, do we require it to be a dual use project when it's on agricultural soils? And what's far more common and works on thousands of acres all over the country and the world is these sheep for grazing as a bare minimum dual use requirement. There are much more elaborate dual use uh, systems that actually involve other forms of agriculture um, in the site, but most developers are going to balk at those. So requiring that I think is not really feasible, um, but but 
I just you know, wanted to defend standard the of just sheep grazing or something like that. You know, if that counts as dual use, I, I don't think that that's uh, okay. crazy. But an apiary is the same dual use. Well, those are all sorts of things. Some people will yeah. argue yes. But, what yeah. was that, Joel? But an apiary is considered dual use. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what my perspective is relative to dual use. I think they should be encouraged. Uh, I think there should be an incentive as opposed to standards that's so damn tight that it becomes not practical. Okay, so how do we incentivize it at the town level? That's right. It's not the, yeah. How about some tax? And well, yeah, I mean, is that, yeah. well, they already don't pay any tax down. So it's not much well, we can do on that. Yeah, they're going to be sure. Sure. I thought the state pays their taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one, way it's set up. That one in Ridgeville, that uh, didn't Justin say that that was uh, representing the fair amount of uh, tax of the town of Lawrence? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. My my understanding of the community solar projects. So what these all fall under? It would be different if you're talking about a larger utility scale project. But these five megawatt and less commercial yeah. projects. My understanding is that. Uh, the state, as part of the incentivization of these projects, that's a word, uh, the state is actually covering the taxes, at least on all of the equipment, and then they're giving the towns a 50% cut of what that appraised value is, is my understanding of how that law is written. I think probably we should find out. Yeah, we can look at that. I mean, otherwise, yeah, incentives are great. I, I much prefer carrots to sticks, but I just don't know at a town level is, is there is anything. I mean, it is being discussed in the in this legislative session again. You know, is there is there something that we could do? You know, is there playing with farmland's current use tax laws, for example? You know, currently, if you pull land out of farm use, current farm use, farmland use, you have to pay the, the penalty. You know, if you're going to do solar, um, but you know, if you were going to do a dual use project, do you waive that to incentivize that? You know? Then, of course, you get to the issue of who's actually going to monitor that over the lifetime of the project. And, And again, that kind of the, the bigger issue is if if someone does uh, another commercial, different type of commercial project, and it's on farmland, should some of the standards, you know, again, be across the board? So I don't know. I mean, I think Auburn has come up with something because Auburn, Auburn for years had some they have an agricultural zone. Of course, they have zoning. You have a lot more flexibility in some ways when you have zoning, which we don't have. Um, so, yeah, do you, if someone takes land out of agriculture and isn't going to do dual use, do you have them pay some type of mitigation fee, which then goes to preserve? Other open space properties, so it's there for the future. Some type of soil bank, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that that is being done. I know that's that's what Thompson has done with development in general. They have a mitigation fee. It's not incredibly high. I think it's like fifteen percent. I'm assuming the grazed valley. I don't know what the fifteen percent is. But. So we have that in some type of form for. Subdivisions and other projects that can't meet phosphor standards. They pay a mitigation fee, which then goes, say, to Commissary Watershed or some other type of group to do remedial act, you know, use the funds for remedial action. But um, I mean, you get into the whole big question, you know, versus. You'd like to have development go into areas where you have, say, sewer and water. And, you know, of course, it doesn't make a difference to solar, but just generally. Uh, you know, one of the things we look at on the Comprehensive Plan Committee is, you know, where do you focus development? I mean, how do you make that work? And solar is one, certainly one. 
type of development that takes a lot of land out of use for other purposes. But it, it kind of gets into the bigger question. Right? Yeah. What, what is the vision that people have for the town? And how do you satisfy the rights of the population as a whole and the private landowner? The thorny issue. Mitigation fees typically, in my opinion, are penalties, penalty fees. Call it the way it is. If you got enough money, it's no big deal. The solar companies seem to have enough money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just don't like the term mitigation fee. Well, yeah, but I mean it's still more of a still more of a carrot than a stick, you know. I mean yeah. and what you don't want to have happen is people then make decisions not to allow their land to be used for agricultural purposes because they don't want to be restricted down the road. Yep. And uh, you know they say, well, we don't need to pay this anymore. Or, you know, so it's sometimes it's the unintended consequences that sneak up on you. Good example is a lot of us could be in a tree growth program. <clears throat> I've chosen not to be because it isn't worth the hassle. Not worth well. I think it was that. So you want to structure something similar in this area, which supports what Steve just said, basically. Ray, could you speak up just a little bit? I'm having yes, trouble. Yes, <laughs> Well, um, but you said something about why you chose not to go into tree growth. Because it isn't worth the aggravation. What was, what, I mean, without getting into deep weeds, what exactly was um, an issue? With that, should I decide to do something with half of that acreage I've got? Mm -hmm. The penalty and the grief involved in it isn't worth it to gotta, deal with the state. Got to get a forestry plan, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but the penalties at the end too, and you know, going through the whole, it just isn't worth the aggravation. You end up paying the taxes that yeah. you. It's like getting a divorce, Barney. <laughs> Not something you want to do. Um, no, I mean, uh, well, well, where I'm going with that is you've got to make it attractive without feeling that we're sticking it to them. Mm -hmm. them with that. Just tell them up front, hey, we don't want you around. Well, I... I... But it seems to me, I think with with talking about borders, um, buffers, um, making sure that all everyone in an area is fully informed about what's going to happen. Um, yeah. And dual use, if you've got land and it was hayed, so that's agricultural. If you have land, you're taking out of agricultural production. I don't think it's a great deal to say, can you make the effort? And again, you don't make it so that if you don't do this, you don't get approved, but is there a way to work with others and perhaps a butters um, to put the land, if it was agricultural, can we at least um, have part of the land being used that way? I, I don't think that's know. a that's the goal. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody, I mean, I guess I shouldn't speak. I do not want the message to solar developers to be that we don't want you around. Mm -hmm. I just want there to be yeah. a more clear set of guidelines around the development. And I understand the viewpoint of, you know, there's a lot of leeway in the existing language for the planning board to come back to them and ask for certain things. But that just leaves things 
you know, to be interpreted differently over time as the makeup of the planning board inevitably changes over time. Mm -hmm. So why not just, you know, revise this now, include some clearer language now around things that we can all agree upon, and then without saying, no, we don't want solar, period, because I, I don't think that's the goal of this group. Yeah. No, just, it's just being so over restrictive. It's, it's where I'm coming from. Okay. I don't disagree with you whatsoever. You've got to have standards that are going to be met. Okay. It's got to be done a certain way to yeah. protect your bodies. No question about it. But, I mean, just so I understand where you're coming from, do you think that the things we've discussed so far are over restrictive? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I Good. I think one of the problems that I've heard from <clears throat> around is that, you know, like the dual use is if you make it a requirement, what if they can't get someone to bring their sheet solar? No, no. You know, it has to be somebody that's reasonably close, has the ability to, to bring their sheep over, you know, mm -hmm. truck them over. And, I mean, there. With that said, there are outfits now traveling all over the Northeast, and they do. literally, they're they're combining yeah. flocks, moving them. You know, we're going to hit this array this week, this array next yeah. week. I mean, we're talking New York and New England wide. I mean, it, it. That's why I say it just it just doesn't feel like it's really that hard, you know. But at the same time, yes, you also can argue. Well, are we setting them up for price gouging? Well, you have to have grazing. Well, yeah. Grazers, what are they going to try? Yeah, you know, seven hundred dollars an acre. You know, I mean, that would be outrageous. You know, so I, you know, I, I can see that too. The flip side of requiring, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, if you're three times the price of what somebody with weed whackers is going to charge, and that's not really that's not really the point either. Is it? Right, because even with grazing, somebody has to monitor that grazing activity. Oh yeah, and that's what happens when you do. Yeah, I mean, it's not just dump sheep there and come back in two months. No. It's just a way of keeping the site actually an active agricultural production instead of just it being a loss, which currently is what happens on pretty much all of the sites. Is it's, uh, it's, they're all generally agricultural and they're all lost agricultural production. Something, something that I, I haven't read or researched yet, crops. If the arrays would have to be spread over a larger area because you have to have more open space between the arrays. But could somebody that wanted to grow crops make it happen between rows of arrays? Yeah, they definitely could. It's being done in places. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but most developers are going to balk at that because they have to go higher. They have to go higher, which is a lot more right. expense in the installation. I mean, I actually spoke with the Long Road, one of the Long Road representatives when we were on the bridge about this, because I, I was asking about, you know, why can't you at least raise these things another two feet in that example, you know, so somebody could, it's not just sheep, you could run towels under it, for example. And he, was, he claimed anyway, well, you know, it would cost, it costs so much more in the, because then suddenly we have to have a, a boom, a man lift out here to install all the panels and do all the work and all of this. So, and that, because I, I Really, that little tiny bit of aluminum is going to cost that much more that you can't raise these up. But he would argue it's not just that; it's the, the installation cost. It makes the project not as favorable. Mm -hmm. But yes, that is being done too. But but those are the sorts of projects that the developers will argue you need some sort of incentivization at the rate payer at the you know, PUC needs to be approving uh, incentivizing it there, which is being done in other states. But they will say that the main rate payers can't absorb the cost, which you know I don't see. I mean, the electrical rates right now are insane. So, but there's also that factor of okay, well, how much of this is how much money are you guys making as developers doing these projects? And it's not, it's not just yeah. I don't know. Anyway, well, one of the things that might be you know sort of plan going forward would be if we look at what some of the other towns are doing 
yeah. Ops and Farnsworth. Well, you guys met with cousins, right? Eric out of Auburn. Can you sit down with him? No? Mm, okay. I thought you were I, talking about my cousins for a minute. I haven't seen my cousins in a while. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I've talked to a few people, you know, I, uh, you know, there's been a couple of studies that have been done, Maine Farmland Trust and Arapuai. They reached out to a number of yeah. towns and I talked to them about our ordinance. And, okay. Um, and Kennebec Land Trust had an intern who did some paper, I think. Um, yeah. So I've reached out to Maine Farmland Trust uh, about this issue and the other open space issues that the Conservation Commission has been working on. And uh, if we were interested, they said that you know we could at one of our meetings, they you know we have to send a staff member potentially to talk to us about how we might make the project more favorable to agriculture anyway. But they do also have a guide that they put together. I mean, actually, yeah. So in they talked to both Steve and I, and uh, Monmouth is mentioned in that uh, that report that they did. Although they highlighted other towns that have more active mechanisms around uh, regulating the solar developments. Yeah. Can I ask Doug? Um, have I'm aware that um, the town of Dresden has sent questionnaires to certain people. Again, I have a very good friend who's a goat farmer in Dresden. Um, and we had a long conversation about solar arrays. And then she sent me information. Um, I wasn't able to access it, but I'm, I'm wondering, Doug, if um, through Maine Municipal or any of that, if you have are aware of other towns doing anything um to see what the town people townspeople think about solar arrays are you at, at all aware of anything i'm not okay oh, no but uh i could look into it okay go to you know check out the mma website and see what they have any uh anything there about it all okay I'll do that. Uh, Doug, is Justin still on the executive committee? Yeah. The MMA? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, another thing to discuss that we raised in our letter was just should there be a provision about the density of these projects in any given area is that possible logical what that would look like you know a perfect example is supposedly right now on the south monmouth road there's the project that's under the review and then the lot that uh is the old ad electric site also supposedly has a lease on it so that hasn't come with both language you guys know um you know should there be a provision saying that you can't have Sites have to have a certain distance between them to prevent any given area of town becoming just completely inundated with these projects. Um, Is it that area right now in demand because of the substation? I mean, that area will be in demand in perpetuity because of the substation, because that's the area that's always going to be most desirable to the solar developers. The shortest distance to the substation is the shortest distance they have to upgrade the power. So my understanding is within two to three miles of the substation is their hotspot. So when you start talking density, I can you know see in that area. Yeah. But, you know, we take the backside of North Monmouth towards Wales. And somebody decides put one in fine. And then six months later the second one pops up. Uh, is that going to be a problem? So you got a density. Are you saying if is the density going to apply strictly to the town borders, or is it going to include abutting towns? Or no, yeah, you know, yeah. It would be if it becomes part of the ordinance. It would be town wide, right? Not something like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm, I'm saying I'm asking 
do we want to do that? Because there's certain areas in town where you could have three of these things and it wouldn't bother anybody probably. But other areas, yeah, you don't want three of them sitting there in proximity, you know, close proximity to each other. Right. Well, that gets into the trick of, you know, suddenly what you just said is suggesting some sort of zones where things are desirable or not. That's a bad word. So, yeah. yeah. So, but I also think you'd have a hard time finding any portion of town where it doesn't ruffle a group of people's feathers. I mean, it's, it's fairly well settled down. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's another question for um, May Municipal, because again we're talking about Monmouth, but as you said, Ray, you know, <laughs> Wales is right there, um, and they. Is there any? Again, I, I'd be curious if there is any discussion going on as to neighboring towns, so that again right over the border you've got all of this stuff we do we try and and be very very careful and then the town next to us or litchfield or wherever it happens to be um they just say oh yeah put them everywhere um so again is there any has there been any conversation at main municipal or or I mean, that's the only organization I can think of um, that, that that kind of conversation would even begin unless there's something else, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, ultimately we have no control over what happens in any other town. So I guess right. really, yeah, I mean, we're talking about Monmouth and what we want Monmouth to look like. Then operate like and yeah i mean i can certain i mean i'll check in with the person my contact with the farmland trust again and see i can either just ask them questions or if people wanted whenever we schedule the next meeting to see if they could join us you know just by zoom probably yeah. then that would be helpful or, or yeah. not you know on the density issue the only thing we have in our ordinance is we have a provision on communication towers and, and the goal was to try to not have them you know either cluster them or not you know just not have them all across the, the ridges the ridges yeah. Yeah. and i i think there's some language in the ordinance about that um that'd be interesting to see what that language actually is mm -hmm. is it a certain number of feet or i think so i think it, it may have been within in miles yeah. i don't know if i can get into the, the library uh, you want to go out there come on right yeah i just don't know if i have the password Used to because we used to get onto the Wi Fi. I think this, this room has Wi Fi. Well, I can look and see if I can find that one. I mean, to me, that just at least makes it so that no particular part of town or people, you know, suddenly it's not like I'm, uh, you know, surrounded. 360 surrounded. I mean, and again, I'm not not because of but like from my house for example right now i can look up at the ridge and i see the 40 acre project up on the ridge i'm going to look to the south there's going to be a 10 acre project right there it's just how many you know and and i mean solar does just feel so different than the forms of development we're used to in this part of the world because of the pace at which it can happen what other development has monmouth seen in the last 40 years that 40 acres, boom, the entire thing is covered with structure. And that's well, the next thing is going to be storage. Well, that's, that's yeah, that was a, <laughs> so yeah, I've been waiting for somebody to buy the Sears property down there and, you know, storage units, gas station, and 
yeah. whatever else. Yeah, I think the I think we should propose a TIF zone to go down there. Well, you know, capture all the value that's going to get added. Just think about that today, driving around from our last economic development meeting. Like, well, there should be a TIF zone because you know somebody's going to buy that eventually and cover the whole thing with stuff. Having served on taxation for eight years, as far as I'm concerned, TIF is a four letter word, uh -oh. but that's just me. All right. Well, I never brought anything up about TIF, but I'm, I'm a little digressing. Why? What why? Ask her, why Bonnie? What? Why? Why is it a four letter word? because I saw it abused terribly and towns left holding the bag. Um, and there, there never seemed to be any consequences. Somebody would come in and they'd get a tiff and they'd get all of these breaks. And then five years later, they were gone and the town was left again, town after town left holding the bag. Um, because, yeah, people want, I mean, it's not unreasonable to want some development growth and, and in your town to, to create income. That's perfectly reasonable. But again, time after time, they were abused by people who... That's all they were interested in. They were not interested in the town. So there's no 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 protection in that in that law for the uh, community for the town. Not enough. Not enough. Okay. And and I mean the land on the ridge here. Um, I would say about five years ago, um, Jerry Smith. I remember one day we would just chatting and he said that the town that that they had put the land on the ridge road into farm and open space and i am i know what farm and open space is and i thought great 20 years and nothing's going to happen it'll you know it'll be agricultural well yeah except if you've got enough money you pay the fit fine and you're you're done and some kinds of corporations and wealthy people just pay the fine and that's it it's not for us average mainers yeah it's a big deal it's just like with tree growth your average landowner is going to get hit with a big fine if they don't align with all of the rules but a big corporation they don't care you know Twenty thousand dollars. Hey, that's no big deal. That's, so, yeah, that's flown around with the solar developers, and part of it is the, I mean, the incentives that they've gotten at the federal level and mm -hmm. state. Level. Yeah, it's enormous. And I, that tax thing, I'm I'm pretty positive about that. They're getting very large tax breaks from the state. Yep. Uh, no longer, the state is covering the the put taxes on their equipment. Yeah, it's probably the personal property tax. Yeah. Yeah, which a lot of small towns don't really pursue generally. No, no. You don't really. It, uh, and every tax incentive I saw in eight years, again, average ta average townspeople, average small towns got left holding the bag. Um, and somebody has to pay those those taxes. Somebody has to pay when the big trucks come in and tear up the roads. Sorry, I'm gonna I go- I won't say tip again, sorry. So, wrong Thank committee. You. <laughs> now my committee is confused. <laughs> a wash for them with the tax, they pay Monmouth property tax? The, my understanding is the state is paying down to Monmouth 50% of the appraised value of the tax. So, so that's, 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 that's my understanding. So go through the, the, the the company that does the has the right. It's a, it just goes direct. Portland goes directly to the town and, and from those two sources. Yeah, I, I think so. That's that is my understanding, but I guess I'm not gonna, you know. Well, there is something in the personal property tax 
generally that you, there's some type of credit provision. I mean, I haven't looked at it in years, but it, it is that the state reimburses the municipalities to some extent on personal property taxes, but the, the developer or the owner has to, you know, make some type of application to do that. Um, I mean, that's just generally. I, in my office at Augusta, we get a form every year that we got to fill out. You know, what do, what do we have for computers or desks? I don't know. We're concerned a little about the Cooper farm up there on the hill, uh, not just with the, with the shooting, but uh, with the, uh, he, he supposedly put a million dollars into the plan, uh, as well as maybe a million dollars into that. Uh, Orchard, uh, and uh, so you, you know, we didn't. Uh, I don't know, we didn't cut any per personal property tax, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, I would think if there, you know, if there's equipment like freezers or you know, uh, washing machine, you know, wash the fruit or before it's locked up or whatever, I mean, they're. There, there could be a revenue source there. And as I say, a lot of small towns just don't seem to be, you know, they don't have the wherewithal. Yeah. To, I, don't know. I don't think Delana Hayes, you know, are yeah. assessing. Yeah. I'm already worried that we've created a massive headache for her with our, yeah. uh, that went out to the yeah. owners. We've had quite a few people contact us. I'm wondering how many people are contacting her directly. So on the on the towers, what we, what we what's in the ordinance says, um, any facility located on one of the town ridge lines identified as a visual resource in the comprehensive plan shall be placed so as to minimize its silhouette against the sky. No tower shall be installed within two miles of another tower unless it is planned and permitted as a multiple user site or camouflage so as to simulate a natural feature of the environment. Um, so there was sort of an attempt on sort of the density issue, but that's that's the only thing we currently have. Yes. And um but there is some precedent for setting a density yeah, and I guess what we're up against though is if you've got the power station there, you know, is that is that where you want to have those developments? For good or bad, a good bad for the neighbors, good for the town. I mean, it's yeah. one of those it becomes kind of a hub. It becomes a yeah, it becomes a hub because it is. But yeah, I mean it does mean at that area. I mean, it's only the large tracts of land. There's not as many as there used to be. It's uh, only large tracts of land that can be developed or well, no, that's that's in vicinity, close vicinity to to I mean there's yours, there's the other Smith family property. There's metal AV electric, but are there any other large parcels now on? On the South Monmouth Road or 9 and 126, say other than Mike Sears in Monmouth. Right. I mean, you can get. You have to look at I the mean, tax maps. I mean, there there are, especially if you start to include, okay, well, we're going to clear cut this wood lot or that yeah. wood lot. I mean, at one point, solo developer, another solo developer was going to put panels on Charlie Hilliard's property there, right across the Wales line, and then they were going to, it was going to cross this, this development, it's going to be quite large, it actually wasn't going to be a commercial solar project of five megawatts, maybe they were going to do like three different five megawatt projects all stacked, which isn't I think technically legal anyway, but it all fell through, but anyway, it was going to come through onto the Bonin Road, it was going to be another, there was a landowner on the Bonin Road in Monmouth, who they were going to clear cut, they were proposing to clear cut their woodlot off. Put panels as part of this larger project there. Now that never got the permitting, but, but that was something the contract had been signed on, or intents had been signed on anyway, a number of years ago now. So, 
So, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yep. inherently, yeah, the focus of the development is in South Monmouth, you know. Um, at the same time, if the project's large enough, then especially if three phase power is close by enough, then that definitely can get farther from the substation. Um, you know, projects like this, though, also illustrate that smaller lots, I mean, there are a lot of lots in the South Monmouth Road that are 10, 15 acre lots, you know. Um, so, is, is another way of doing this, would it make more sense to say cap the I mean, I I would guess I would prefer density, uh, something that density in an ordinance. But another way of doing it would be to cap the megawatt production, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. So that gets trickier because megawatt. You would hope that megawatt potential is going to change over time as technology evolves and everything else. And um, but that's how these projects are all regulated. I mean, if you look at how these projects are committed, it's all these community solar projects for this program through the state have to be below five megawatts so most of them. Mm -hmm. like jerry's families is 4.99 megawatts four point, yeah 4.99999 so, so it's not you know that wouldn't be yeah i mean that is that is a standard that is used for permitting you know, we say we can only have 10 megawatts of production in the town at the moment you know that feels more arbitrary to me than a density. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't get to the density issue. That's still Are they gonna you can have one after one after one after one, and then somebody ten miles away on the other side of town signs a contract five years from now or something. Well, we can't do it because we met our ten megawatts. So it's irrelevant. And is the state or the federal government going to preempt the area so that the towns can't do that type of regulation? What, what happened, there was a lot of litigation over towers. Yeah. And, and the developers have been able, were able to successfully litigate because, it, you know, they say we're licensing. You know, there are federal licenses involved that yeah. kind of preempt state uh, ordinances. And a lot of times, you know, we, we dealt with a couple. We were able to kind of reach some compromise on their projects, but always in the back was the fact that they could kind of go to court and would probably lose if we were too restrictive. But I don't know whether that gets it's going to spill over into the solar. I think right now the market's so hot that if a developer feels like they don't want to play ball with the town, they're just going to go to the next town over. I yeah. mean, it just there's just so much potential when you look at what's coming down the pipe with the Inflation Reduction Act and all the incentives to that. You know, and I still can't get a clear picture on the South Mom and Subdivision what the actual capacity of that is, although in talking to an electrical engineer that works on the transmission lines in Maine, he was like, well, they can upgrade that substation, no problem, and boom, you have a tremendous capacity. Yeah. 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 So Dave, Dave Mills, that was, I think he worked in that area. Was involved in that project, and he said, "Yeah, that has a lot more potential capacity." Yeah. Than, you know, because I thought of—I had heard at one point, "No, oh, there's only so many." But he said he thought it's, it's got gotten a wide range of numbers from. Yeah. I mean, because Long Road, somebody from Long Road was also telling people in town that that was going to max up the capacity yeah. of the substation. That was another thing that was being said. I'm sorry, your five megawatts definitely does not max up the capacity. <laughs> I know the developer told me that there's 50 megawatts of capacity on the substation. So everybody yeah. seems to be getting very different. I don't know if CMP would share that information with us. Well, that's the whole yeah. Nobody wants to share any information seems, from the solar industry. So um Joel, what else did we what else is in our letter that we haven't talked about? I think that covered it. I think you know, maybe the only other thing we raised the issue, just a concern about just uh trails and yeah, things like that in right town right. yeah but whether that's something that can really be yeah you know, governed by you know yeah. voluntary access anyway I'm not really yeah so the one on the South Monmouth road now uh, there's a snowmobile trail and uh 
the owner said he's gonna have he's gonna relocate it. Of course, he said clearly, he said, I don't have to do this. You know, I'm yeah. letting them use it now. And uh, he said, I've been in touch with, I can't remember, someone from probably the Cockneywog and Railways and so whatever. But the plan there is to move the trail to toward the fish hatchery road behind the, his barns. Yeah. And come around, sort of around the site. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, they don't want anybody, I think, within the perimeter, you know, outside the perimeter, they may be open to snowmobiles, cross country, hiking, whatever, but they don't want people in the middle of the community. Right. Yeah. And they're required to fence them all in. They also, yeah. I think, yeah. want them fencing. Yeah. You know, if there was a trail system in Monmouth, if there was an established sort of trail system, then I think we could kind of regulate around that a little bit. Just for the established trail system. Right? Yeah. yeah. Because if you don't have it, if it's not there, yeah, then it's too elusive to kind of focus would, on it. Would that only be if it was actually deeded into all of the? I don't think so necessary. You know, even if there were, yeah, I don't know whether you have to have conservation easements. Or, um, remember, at a discussion when they were doing the expansion of. The medical center. We kind of did a little walk around, and, and there was a clear trail from this housing project on the Blue Road, you know, coming across the property to the quick stop. And you know, they were saying, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna block that access." We're gonna block that. And I said, "Well, isn't it nice to have kind of a path?" Through town, you know, that people can walk on. And of course, they said, well, but if you see what happens on that, you know, people are drinking and throwing their pee in the bottles. Kids so have used that trail for years. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, so uh, that, that issue probably for this is not worth exploring. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could put in where there are established recreational trails that efforts will be made to um, accommodate. accommodate. Yeah. yeah. Right. Just that, a recommendation. A recommendation. Not a requirement. And that, that's yeah. probably a reasonable thing because you're, you're dealing with big tracts of property. Because there are trails that go all all through. I mean, I guess it's not one major trail, but there certainly are trails because they come up the ridge. They come through the woods and go up the ridge. Yeah. Well, I made a kind of made a point about that when we went up the long road development. They talked about the hunting that there were people that still went down and hunted behind the development. And they were fine with it, so they said, so the owner is. Yeah, well. I think noise, I just remember noise was the only other thing that we talked about. Yeah, yeah. So, as we saw up at Long Ridge, there are those, what do they call them? Inverters. Inverters. And they're, they talk about, I mean, the, the developer that comes in is saying, well, we're going to be back far enough. And, and they get issues of whether we make them put up some kind of screening of you know, concrete something around it or um, the sound buffering. Sound buffering to keep the sound from. I mean, they're claiming that we won't hear it. I mean, I, I know when we went to the long, by the time we walked back up the hill, we couldn't really hear it. Mm -hmm. Right, but on a smaller project like this, now maybe the inverters are also smaller. Yeah, but your distance to the nearest the butters dwelling in particular might be a lot smaller. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just 
I mean, what is the standard? What's already in the in the rules? There must be something in the rules yeah. about noise. And yeah. Is it? Yeah, we have noise standards, and it's you know so many decibels at the property line. And again, you have to have the special equipment. Which I don't think Bond has. Yeah, um, Dave Shaw has a meeting. I think he might have had to go out and get one for. I can't remember who was trying to do something. Yeah. I also have certified meter town meter. Um, but there is a a noise, and it's too low in our ordinance. You know, for the real being practical, eighty five dBA is the acceptable standard. Okay. Is, it, is it is it also a certain uh, continuity of that noise? I mean, is it you know, or you know, or is it just period? There cannot be noise over eighty five. Well, yeah, DBA. so level of one minute. I mean, it's a standard. It's page. Look at fifty one and fifty two of our ordinance. That's slower than eighty five. Residential seven a.m. to ten p.m. You have a residential abutter. It's supposed to be 60 uh, at night, dropping to 45. If you have a commercial abutter, 65 during the day, 55 at night. And again, the residential time is 10 p.m., which is, well, some people are night owls. Uh, industrial is 70 and 60. So yeah, for well, one minute a day. Okay. Well, the maximum permissible sound pressure level of any continuous, regular, or frequent or intermittent sound source of sound produced by any activity shall be limited according to the abutting use and time period as listed below. Sound level shall be estimated at a level four feet above ground at the property boundary of the source. And then it talks about the meter and the standard. Um, so maybe that's already all sufficient. Then. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty quiet. Yeah. Yeah. 60. 60 I mean, it also, yeah. So is this is solar commercial or is it industrial? Well, no, it, it, the, the said, you, yeah. no, it, it, it depends what the abutter is. Oh, okay. okay. So if the abutters are mostly residential, um, 60 it's time. sixty at the okay. at the boundary. Okay. So in this in every instance I can think of encounter is sixty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For this and yeah. The other. But it's something to look at. You know, yeah. that was I hadn't really considered noise on the solar until we went and looked at that other project because it was quite loud next to it. Yeah. Yeah, then in, in talking to an abutter, um, I was asking, I was asking her about the noise because the other thing is those those panels are rotating, so and they you know the echoes through the entire thing. And I asked her if she noticed that. She said no, except for every morning, I think it is when they go the full way around. Then it, I guess it's you know, a brief moment in the morning where it's quite quite loud, but then the rest of the day she's like, it's really not very noisy. Now they're up on top of the hill, you know, if they were down at the bottom of the hill, well, then does the noise yeah. go downhill? Yeah. Down. But there's like there. Yeah. Well, I can hear the train at night in my house. Yeah, me too. I can hear cars all the time. You yeah. Know? Like it's not yeah. you're, you're close I can to hear 126 from my house. Oh, really? Two miles. Yeah. Um can I just um because I know this was an issue with the ridge um, development, and I just looked through the information from Novel, and maybe I missed it, but is there a bond, is there um, provisions for bonding for when the project is dismantled? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I looked, I, couldn't find it, but all right. Yeah. I believe you. 
the, the state now requires it. I don't know if it did when we first got involved in this, but the state also has a bonding requirement. But we uh, require some kind of bond payable to the town. Well, it's getting close to eight. Um, we could come back in a couple of weeks. We could talk to the farmland trust. We could look at some ordinances if people want to spend a little time. Yep. On the uh, noise end of it, just to give you some idea, the, the, the noise in the real world as we function, okay, is in the 80s. Vehicle exhaust noise in the state of Maine is acceptable up to 95 dBA. Okay, so that's why I say monitor is really on the low scale with the ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I'm, I'm happy to reach out to Farmland Trust and, um, yeah, see, see what else exists for ordinances. I also tried to take notes during this. Do you want me to, like, write just some of the issues that yeah, we talked about great. with some information, yeah. Yeah. different ideas about them? I mean, we're supposed to keep, I think any committee is supposed to have minutes. That's one thing. Can, can we also find out about any other towns? Um, and I'll I'll reach out. I I had trouble getting in touch with her, but I'll reach out again to my friend in Dresden. But I would be curious as to if, <laughs> excuse me if there are other small towns that are thinking about the possibility and what they're what they're doing or if they're doing anything. Yeah, I think a lot of towns are. I mean, I had someone call me from, I can't remember now what town it was. They, they wanted a copy of our ordinance and we sent it over and they could look at it. But yeah. they had sort of picked it up from somewhere, maybe the farmland trust or whatever. So let's see, today's the first. What what are people thinking? Um with the caveat that uh that we're expecting a baby any day. Uh, yeah. so four, with that caveat, then yeah. you know four weeks. I, yeah. Let's see. We've got next week there's a select board meeting. Right. Then you've got a week off. And another select board, so maybe the four weeks from tonight would be a good go that long. March first. You want to go that long? You want to go two weeks? I just, I mean, what's our when do we have to have something back to the select board by? And especially if you want the planning board to really yeah. tear yeah. through it, then so, yeah, yeah. going to be a time. I, I just two feel weeks. Like, two weeks is fine. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. I may email and yeah. say I can't make it, or can we reschedule or something? Sure. Then you know. I can I can also yeah. that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. do they still have snugglies uh, yeah. Uh, yeah okay and uh, will we do it here again is Dennis going to keep setting us up with the owl because... well we might the room might be available up on okay so I'll probably kind of snuck in yeah before I yeah. It's in yeah. Way. yeah. I, I, mean, I just didn't want to interrupt. No, they are already. I had heard they were, you know, they, um, Lori had told me that they had a meeting, that she had a meeting. But I guess it wasn't widely uh, noted. So, uh, and I was as well attended. Oh, go yeah, after the third notice and see as to where we were at the <laughs> meeting, I was going to suggest TJ's. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do they have Zoom capacity at TJ's? <laughs> so, who's our new RSU2? You know him well, maybe Jim Grandel. Who left that we needed? 
John Hammond. John was very, he, he was the head of the flight committee, a right chair. So with Richmond leaving, and then a whole lot of uh, you know, uh, ARPA money or something coming in, and uh, uh, it was really important that we had somebody very financially to so and, and Jim. I said she wasn't there for the yeah. he created the RSU for us. So yeah. It, and he'll you know ideal fit in that role. So is the next the meeting the fifteenth? Fifteenth. 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 Today's the first, so we'll be the fifteenth. Wednesday the fifteenth. 